Engine Repair 2 Test 7, and this is a session about engine oiling. Engine oiling. Okay, so there's a few little, you know, questions here that just seem like no-brainer questions, and we've talked about this a bunch of times, about how uh, the W and S and SAE 5W30 means winter instead of weight or without or with or whatever. It basically means winter, and there are people, if you tell them that, they will argue with you about it, but that's that's what it stands for. You can call the SAE, and they'll tell you. Oil change intervals are specified by the vehicle manufacturer. A, generally only include time between oil changes. B, are maximum time and mileage intervals. C, are maximum time and mileage intervals. Um, excuse me, minimum. That's minimum versus maximum. And then finally, only include miles driven between oil changes. So time, miles, minimum, maximum, what? That's C, maximum time and mileage intervals. And they misspelled mileage there, too. That's, I, I abhor somebody that writes a test that's supposed to be teaching somebody and misspells mileage. M-I-L-A-G-E is not how mileage is spelled, is it? That's wrong, isn't it? Every one of you guys knows it. Even the ones of you guys that are wearing Cammy Flash hats knows that, right? <laughs> All right. Most conventional parentheses, mineral oil, is made from what API group? American Petroleum Institute group. Yeah, what's that would be? That's going to be group two. That's not one you could guess your way through, is it? Which rating is the ACEA rating specified for use by many European vehicle manufacturers? A, A3 and B3. All right. Technician A says the engine oil used should be meet the vehicle's manufacturer standards. That's obviously true. Technician B says the specified viscosity of the oil should be used. Both of those guys are right, but I will tell you that that's not quite as critical on older vehicles as it is on newer vehicles. And all that. Yeah. I mean, older. Well, the older vehicles are not as critical in what the oil has to do. You understand what I'm saying? So the older vehicles are basically, I mean the newer vehicles, like for, for instance these new 5 valve Fords, any of them that have variable valve timing or any of that kind of stuff, uh, you better put exactly the right oil. Hybrid vehicles don't vary, don't move away from what oil is supposed to be in there. It's got to you know, go by what they say, because if you don't, what happens when you work on a hybrid vehicle and you put the wrong kind of oil in it, is the customer comes back and they say, now doggone it, this little thing on my dash said I was getting 96 miles to the gallon before, and now I'm only getting 92. And you did something that changed it. If their tire pressure is not right, if they ain't got the right tires on it, if any little thing on a hybrid is, you know, tweaks a little bit, it'll cause their gas mileage numbers to go down. And that thing is, you know, that's their big deal, is they want all those mileage and all that, you know, so. Um, a lot of times if you tune a car up, though, and you go ahead and just air the tires up and get the air pressure where it's supposed to be, you'd be surprised how many of them will come in and they want a tune-up, and in addition to everything else they've neglected, they've let their air go pressure go without checking it for a while, and they'll have like 22 pounds of air in their tires or something. I mean, usually, the, you know, it'd be a varying amount. So if you run over a nail or something, you got molecular bleed through. Some tires leak worse than others. My wife's Explorer, I don't hardly ever have to put air in her tires, but on my Taurus, i got to put air in them about once a month. I'm talking about all four of them, you know. So. But uh, anyway, uh, let's see, Technician A, let's see. Technician A says some vehicle manufacturers recommend an LSAC grade be used in the engine. Technician B says an oil with a specified uh, API rating and SAE viscosity rating should be used in an engine. That's number six. That is C. That's both of them. All right. All right. Two technicians are discussing oil filters. Technician A says the oil will remain perfectly clean if just the oil filter is changed regularly. Uh, Technician B says oil filters can filter particles smaller than the human eye can see. Who's right about that? B is right about that, but you're not going to have you're not going to have clean oil. Just uh, you're two hours late. Uh, you been heavy. Running around. Running around. Come on. All righty then. You got and, uh, a regulator, uh, regulator, regulator, regulator. Oh, that's laying out there on the um, uh, service desk. That, pla that black plastic thing with a little knob on it. Let me know if you can't find it. Okay. Um, let me see here. Uh, which one are we on? Number eight. The purpose of the oil filter bypass valve is to do what? Or bypass the filter. 
know when the oil filter becomes clogged. If the oil filter becomes clogged, would it be wise just to go ahead and let it be clogged and not send no oil nowhere? If the oil filter <laughs> clogs, see you see them filters behind you on the, and you'll see the little part of it that's got the spring and all that. Basically, that's set up so that if the oil can't go through the filter, it squeezes that spring and it goes around the filter and it goes ahead and lubricates the engine. Because dirty oil is better than no oil, right? Look at what's at stake. That's real expensive. I want to tell you something else. Some of those, there's a particular breakover year in Jeep Cherokees, and it's in the early 90s, if I remember right, or late 80s, where the oil pump relief valve is built into the filter on one of those year models, and it's built into the pump on the other one. And the filters look just alike, and if you put the wrong filter on there, you can destroy the engine. You know, so you better be really careful about that. The oil change place down below the uh, place where I work burned up two motors like that. And we had to change them out up there. Uh, of course, they got insurance and all that. But anyway, I mean, they, put, they were innocent in everything they did, except they felt like, well, this is, they just used the filter that looked the same, you know, and without looking at the number, because they felt like, well, this is what I used last time I did a Jeep, you know, the guys in the oil change pit. Uh, so that's a, that's not uh, ubiquitous. I mean, it's not all over the place. It's just only on that one year model that I know about. Something else that'll happen sometimes is uh, the oil pump, and this is going to be really sound really weird, but I've seen set of circumstances where the oil pump would lose its prime. What happens is, and you know, some of these like some of these uh, V6 Buicks uh, that have the oil pump on the outside of the engine down there, you know, the, with the distributors in the front going through the timing cover and the oil pump's down in there and a relief valve built in the timing cover. Uh, V6, some V6 Fords and some V6 GM engines are like that, some of them, you know, the Buicks particularly. And uh, we would go to change the oil on one of them Buicks and you, if you if it was hot when it came in and you left that oil filter off too long piddling around before you put it back on there, you go to crank it up and you wouldn't get no oil pressure. I mean, none. You know, you, I mean, even though you had oil in there, it wouldn't drink, it wouldn't pick up oil. So what you'd have to do is there's a plate that you can take off and see those gears, and you can see it down there. Take some bolts off, see those gears, and you pack those gears full of grease, <laughs> put them back on, and then it'll suck some oil in there and it'll pick up. Some of these Cadillacs used to people pull up there on their Cadillac outside of the convenience store, and they go into Southside Curb Market or wherever, and they come back out and they fire up their Cadillac on a hot day, and they've lost their oil pressure. And the Cadillac said. Now, it's going to sound stupid, that in order for the mechanics, see, it goes in on the hook because they lost their oil pressure and the engine's rattling. So they, you put like 20 quarts of oil in the engine. <laughs> it just fills everything up. And you force, because the oil pump's on the nose of the crankshaft on those, and you force it to get a prime by just filling everything up with oil too far. And then you drain it down to where it's got five quarts in it. That's what they said to do to get that prime. I keep from having to tear anything down, you know. But that was just a crazy bunch of stuff. Of course, oil's four dollar and a quart now in some places, you know. That'd be expensive. Uh, let me see here. Different brands of oil can be used in a vehicle from one oil change to another if they meet vehicle specifications. Because all oil is what? AMC. How about M I S C I B L E? Miscible. 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 Yep. If it's meeting the specs, you can use it. That's the long and short of it is. Number 10. All right. Um, older engines that use flat bottom lifters should use oil or an additive that has enough what? Zinc. Zinc. Flat bottom lifters. When you're pulling um, lifters out of one that's got flat bottom lifters, you need to be looking at those bottom of those lifters and see if they're concave or worn out. And if they are, the camshaft probably needs to be replaced. Those old 350 Chevrolets used to be the world's worst around the lobe off of the camshaft. And, you know, the valves would quit, valve would quit opening on one cylinder. And when you crank it up, it sounds like a machine gun popping out the carburetor. Pop, 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 pop. And uh, that'll be a camshaft thing, you know, flat lobe on a camshaft. And uh, my sister got this, uh, or my, or I my, bought this 77 Caprice, and it had a 305 in it, and it was doing that, and we put a camshaft in it out of a 350, and it ran good, but it just sucked gas. <laughs> All right. Um, which of the following is not a characteristic of satisfactory engine oil? A, resist foaming. B, paper, excuse me, proper viscosity. C, pours at low temperatures, or D, provides dry friction between moving parts. 
dry friction? Please, we don't want that. That's going to be deep. All viscosity refers to which of these? Somebody tell me. Is it the tendency to, of all to increase flow, the tendency of all to resist flowing, the divided into body and fluidity, or is it the most important property of lubricating oil? That's actually C, believe it or not. It resists flowing. It's resist flowing. Viscosity. If it's more heavier viscosity, it doesn't want to, you know, it's kind of like the honey you're pouring out of your little jug and out. Which of the following should be used when changing the oil in a car with a gasoline engine made in 2004 or later? Listen to the parts guy. SMAPI. That's what you got to use. What's the difference between uh, CI4 and SM? And if it's time it says C instead of S, it starts its, com it's, its compression fire. That's right. Okay, what statement below the best, best defines the term miscible, M-I-S-C-I-B-L-E? A, the change in viscosity from cold to hot temperatures. B, the resistance to oil flow. C, the lowest temperature at which oil will flow. D, oil can mix with other oils without causing problems. D. That's going to be D. We figured that out earlier. Didn't we? One other question. Got that? Uh, so remember now, you guys are going to have to uh, dig in your books when you do your finals. I won't be setting up here spoon feeding you anything. Engine oil life monitor may be based on what? A PCM pr programmed algorithm? Vehicle mileage? Either A or B? Neither A or B. There's going to be Charlie. A PCM controlled algorithm. Um, and of course, you got an oil quality you know, sensor in the pan on some vehicles too. Engine oil life monitor may be based, never mind, I already read that one. Many oils are identified by two numbers, i.e. 10W30. The types of oil referred to as what oils? What do what they call those kind of oils? Multigrade. Multigrade oils, number 16, multigrade oils. Which of these oils contains no detergents or additives and is not suitable for use in engines? A. No. B. Anybody know? Uh, number B. S-A. 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 Yeah. Oil with a high viscosity has a blank resistance to flow with a lower viscosity. That's sort of a simple question. That's a engine oil level should be checked A with the engine running, B with the engine parked on level ground. Both A and B, neither A nor B. B. There's going to be B there. Technician A always inspects or replaces the drain plug gasket when performing an oil change. Technician B says warm oil holds contaminants and flows faster than cold oil. Now, yes, that's true. I mean, C is right on that one. It's best to change your oil after the engine's been running. If you pull in there with the engine good and hot when it's been running and you screw that drain plug out, all of the contaminants and everything that would have settled to the bottom of the pan are going to go screaming out of there with the oil. That's what you want. You want your contaminants to get gone. I'll tell you something else that, we, that some people will do. You know, the old steel oil pans had that nut welded on the inside of them for your oil drain plug. And if you're, if you're screwing any of these oil drain plugs out, and it gets, you can't, you ought to be able to break it loose and screw it all the way out of your fingers. If you break it loose and you have to screw it out with a wrench, you need to be putting another oil drain plug in it. And sometimes that people don't, you know, will fool with that. They'll will force it back in there. Now, how many of you guys have tried to take an oil drain plug out of an engine you're changing the oil in and it wouldn't come out? It just turns round and round and round. <laughs> you ever had that? I've had it. That's just irritating as all get out. You're trying to take oil drain plug out. It just goes round, round, round. Because who, somebody kept just stretching the threads and stretching the threads until they just pulled off. And now all of a sudden, you can't get those threads on the inside to bite and come out. You know, it's just annoying. As a matter of fact, in extreme circumstances, uh, we had to replace oil pans because of that hogwash. You know, but that's why it's so important. If that thing's hard, hard coming out and you're changing oil in somebody's car, if that oil drain plug is hard coming out of there, or it looks like the threads, if it's an aluminum oil pen, and it looks like the threads are beginning to become compromised, uh, come and tell me about that, and we'll do something about it. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. I've actually took, you know the little spark plug inserts that you put in the aluminum heads, you know, that you got to tap and it spreads that hole out and makes it big? I put those in aluminum oil pens. They actually have drain plugs now that, that are kind of tapped uh -huh. that you can actually use a slightly bigger hole. Yeah, I've actually done, seen that. It sort of makes a mess. Uh, I usually, if I can, like in the steel oil pans, 
Some people will have an idea that the oil pan is messed up and they'll <laughs> put one of those self-tapping plugs in it. And they've, those have been around for a long time. But a lot of times when people put those in there, they aren't necessary because the oil pan's not hurt. You just put another oil drain plug in there and they're okay because that thing's real hard in there. I mean, it's not so hard you can't cut it one of them nuts he's talking about. If you put in, if in an aluminum oil pan like Gene's truck that he's got, uh, Gene's truck had this issue where the, the threads in the oil pan were screwed up. And we basically just put a steel insert in there like you would for a spark plug and then got a drain plug with that thread pitch. And it worked real smooth, you know. And it takes care of that problem. All right, let me see here. Um, so we'll going down here. Which one am I on right here? Normal oil pump pressure with, uh, in an engine is what? Everybody like that answer? Oil pump pressure is how many PSI? You like that? SD. He's right. 10 to 60. The oil pump actually, unless you have some restriction, is not going to produce pressure either. That's why you have a relief valve. Does it regulate? It's like a that's like a pressure regulator more than it is anything else. So it's what we call an oil pump relief valve, but it's really a pressure regulator. Two technicians are discussing oil pumps. Technician A says many oil pumps are driven directly off the front of the crankshaft. Can you think of one that you've seen lately that's driven that way? Anybody? Where's the oil pump on your escort? How's it driven? The one you're rebuilding Stages. on the front of the crank. You know that piece we replaced? That's right. Yeah, it's on the front of the crank. All right. Let's see. Technician B says some are driven from the distributor if the engine uses a distributor type ignition system. Who's right about that? Both of them are. Both of them guys are right, yeah. A typical oil pump can pump how many gallons per minute? Three, six. 50 to 100 gallons. You'd be really surprised. You can take an oil pump like that when I got up there above your head in that shelf. There's a bunch of oil pumps up in there of different varieties. And you can stick that pickup tube down in an oil can and you can turn that rod with your fingers and it'll squirt oil from here to that ball just with one twist of your finger. Just use it. You'd be surprised how powerful that oil pump is. Uh, in typical engine lubrication systems, what components are the last to receive oil the first to suffer from a lack of oil or oil pressure? Yeah, the valve train is actually the first thing it's going to suffer. And also, that's kind of calculated because it's the first thing that can do without oil pressure without suffering damage. It's also the first thing that is going to make noise, and that's going to alert you that something's wrong. You see what I mean? That's the last place the oil goes. So everything else is going to get oil before it ever makes it up there. See? Now you're still lubricating your crank, and you're still lubricating your cam bearings and stuff, although... It goes by the cam bearings on these engines that's got the camshaft in the head. It goes by those on the way to the, you know, through the push rods up to that, to the rocker arms and all. And so if, if those lifters aren't getting oil, then they're going to, you're going to hear clattering and stuff, you know, lifter clatter and all that kind of thing. Uh, and that's what people usually mix up with, they get confused with labor knock, you know, from pre-ignition or detonation or something like that. But, which has nothing to do with the valves, but people call it valve clatter, you know. But, uh, but if you hear a clickety, clickety, clack, clack, all you can do is add some oil to it and it'll usually take care of it. Um, alrighty then. Let's see. Uh, hydrodynamic lubrication created by the wedging action of oil between the crankshaft journal and bearing can be as high as what? 1,000 PSI. 1,000 PSI, that's hydrodynamic lubrication. What type of oil pump is driven by the crankshaft? I see they got different types. Number 26. A and B. A and B, that's right. It can be a gear rotor or an internal external gear. And you've got the, uh, you've got these intermeshing gears and the oil pumps like that with the drive sticking up up there. Uh, there's a whole bunch of that stuff. And you and inspecting an oil pump pretty important. When in doubt, if you're building an engine and you're putting one in the other that's new, you know, in other words, if you're trying to build something really reliable, it's always smart just to throw an oil pump on it while you're there. But you can also, when you get it all built up, and Lundy's going to be working on putting his crankshaft and his escort engine and everything today, 
everything together like it's supposed to be, it's a good idea to take the oil drain plug out of it, not the oil drain plug, the oil sending unit, and shoot some shop air in there and see if you hear oil pressure leaking anywhere, you know, air leaking, because it's going to go everywhere the oil goes, and if you hear a loud hissing somewhere, and the oil gets warm, it's the thinnest gasoline, and it's going to squirt out of a place where there's a loose bearing or something, and you won't have no oil pressure when the engine gets hot. So everything you can check while you're put building it, the better off you are. So he's got plastic gauge over there he's going to use to see how much bearing clearance he has, and it shouldn't be over about a thousandth of an inch, one and a half at the most, and that kind of thing. So, because uh, see, we didn't replace the crankshaft, we're just putting new bearings in that one. You can mic them, but it's the most accurate thing, plastic gauge, because that's where it lives. You got me? Uh, and it's cheap. It don't cost much. Um, let's see. Lower than specified oil pressure is measured on a high mileage engine. Technician A says worn main or rod bearings could be the cause. Technician B says a clogged oil pump pickup screen could be the cause. Who's right about that? That's Charlie. Both those guys. Um, there was a guy one day that came out here. Uh, came walking over here. He was, he was working on some kind of a construction project we had going on on the campus, and he was asking me about his. And I can't remember how we did arrived at that, but I told him I said the pickup screen is clogged up on your oil pump because he was describing what. We did. I don't even remember the details, but I do remember that that guy went over there and he got under that truck on the grass and he put a pan under it and he drained the oil out of it and he shined a pin light up in there and he saw that oil screen through his drain plug hole and he saw that it was clogged and he got some WD-40 and some other stuff and a little tiny brush and all <laughs> and he brushed all of that crud off of that screen and then he sprayed a bunch of you know stuff in there to wash all of that out of the oil pan good as he could and he fixed his problem laying right out there in the grass without ever pulling anything out but the drain plug and using a flashlight and stuff. That guy was motivated, you know, you know what I mean? So, but he did it. I mean, I saw it happen, and whenever he got through, he filled it up, and he had oil pressure, and he was in the wind. I don't know how long it would take for that stuff to grab and go up, you know, suck up there again. But that's the problem with these mom-and-pop cars that's been driven to the country store and back and never allowed to warm up. They get sludged up so bad that eventually they start starving for oil. And you know what they do at the dealership when they got an engine that's sludged up really bad? They replace the motor. They replace it. Yeah, it's cheaper to replace that engine and, and, and safer for the customer and everybody else to just take that engine and put it aside and put another in, put a fresh engine in it. Toyota had a bunch of them back in around, around 2000. It had bad PCV systems. No, nothing wrong with the That was being driven or maintained or anything, but the PCV system wasn't working right. And it was sledging those engines up. And when one of those came in there, if it was bad enough, they put a motor in it. You know, and it was, and I've seen them do it at the Dodge place. They gave me an engine, and they, and there was really nothing wrong with the engine except it was sludged up. It was a, I can't remember, it was 3.9 or something that I got from the Dodge place in Enterprise. All right, and because they had replaced the motor because it was sludged up. Uh, but always let your car warm up before you shut it off. You won't have trouble with that. See, engine running too cold is not a good thing. Um, let me see. Uh, it also fouls a spark plug, and I preach that all the time. Let me see. Uh, Engine oil passages in an engine block are called what? Galleries. Galleries. He's been reading. Galleries is good. That's a good word for that. Dry sump system is used in some high performance vehicles because of why? It allows the engine to develop more power. It allows the vehicle to corner for or brake for long periods of time. It allows for oil capacity, uh, greater oil capacity so the oil temperatures can be controlled. All the above. Yeah, basically they don't. It's where the oil doesn't slosh around in there. You know these uh, these uh, top fuel dragsters and everything. You know they got a, a whole gaggle of uh, oil pumps and fuel pumps. You know chained together. <laughs> it's real strange looking whenever you look at it. But each one of the cylinders on the top fuel dragster has as much horsepower as a NASCAR engine. You know. You can, I mean, you can take a whole NASCAR engine, and each cylinder's got like 1,500 horsepower, and there's like, you know, eight cylinders, however many, maybe nine, ten, whatever. You know, how many cylinders I just stick on in things. And when that thing goes through the through the uh, eighth mile, or however far they're shooting it through there, that engine only turns 900 RPM. 900 revolutions going through the eighth mile is all it turns. That's pretty stunning. And you know what they do with it after they go through that one eighth mile race? They rebuild it. They rebuild it again every time. I don't have that kind of money. 
the, the Army had a drag, top fuel dragster over there at one of them Skills USA competition things in St. Louis, I mean in Kansas City. And I was talking to those guys about that. And I had never really been to that racing stuff and all that, but boy, you can really blow a lot of money real fast on that stuff. You know what I mean? I mean, I knew if I built a fast car, somebody else always have a faster one. I never win no money like that, you know. All right, so let's see. Let me go on down here. Where are we at? 30. 30. Engine oil cooler usually uses what to cool the oil? What do you think, guys? Coolant usually uses coolant. Now there are some oil coolers that use air, but usually it uses coolant to cool the oil. Um, when's the last time you saw an oil cooler? Two days ago. <laughs> hey, did you, have you seen an oil cooler lately? You know that police car out there? You know them big ugly lines that go there that hook up to that thing under there? That's an oil cooler. That's the difference between a police car and a regular Crown Vicky that got an oil cooler on Right. Um, on Volkswagen bug engines, there's an oil cooler that actually has, it's like a little radiator up in that, you know that, you know, that hump looking shroud that's in the back? Up in that thing, there's a little oil cooler and the air blow, wind blows through it all the time because that fan on the back of the generator. And it uses air, but most of them are using coolant. Uh, and what does that mean? If you have oil in the coolant, and I'm not talking about coolant in the oil. All right, you got oil in the coolant. And that means, you generally means you got a busted oil cooler. If you open your, if you look at your motor oil, and it looks like peanut butter, and it's all thick and gooey, we had a, uh, a, a uh, Saturn uh, in here a while back, back when Chelsea Lee was in here, and her and Sean uh, Grant, they had to put an oil cooler in that thing. And to put an oil cooler in that thing, you had to pull the top of the motor off, and that oil cooler right down there nestled in that valley, and you pull the cover off of that cover, oil filter cover, and there was a little radiator in there about this big, and that darn thing was $400. Wow. And it was really hard finding one because Saturns are sort of on their way out, you know. Yeah. We found one at a dealer, and it was $400 and something dollars. And we put it in there, put it all back together, and it ran like a sewing machine. But you had to wash all of that peanut butter out of the cooling system. It was terrible. But now if you pull your your dipstick and you see peanut butter looking stuff in your oil, see when oil mixes with coolant, it always is about the same color. But where it's at is going to tell you where your problem is. Usually, what's usually wrong if you got coolant in the oil? Anybody got any idea what's usually wrong? Intake gaskets do that. Intake gaskets will bust and get cool on your oil. Intake gaskets can also slip and cause an engine to burn oil because it can actually draw oil from the valley in there. You know, if it's one of them that's got, you know, the little, if in other words, the under the intake is in the, in the splash oil, it can pull oil in there. So you can have coolant leaks and on these Chevrolets and some of these other ones and these Fords nowadays, the newer ones, that's got these composite gaskets that are made of plastic and silicone. Those things like to go sorry. And it happens on those trucks like that all the time. I haven't seen a lot of that on Dodges, but Chevrolets and Fords will do that. That gasket will start leaking, you know. Um, anyway, I sort of got, uh, i got to remember how to, to tell you all that stuff because I'll forget it if I don't. Okay, well, let me see. Let me figure out where I'm at here. 31. Technician A says oil pressure is normally higher when the engine is cold. Yep. Uh, technician B says normal engine oil pump pressure ranges from 20 to 80. Uh, for every 1,000 engine RPM. Who's right about that? Just That's A, a basically. A. The, the minimum is, that you're looking for is 10 pounds per 1,000 RPM. That's the minimum that you're required, I mean, that you can get away with. Uh, so, but anyway, um, all these facts represent the special oil needs of a turbocharged engine, except what? The oil change interval is no more important than a normally aspirated engine. That is not true on a turbocharged engine. Even the way you let that engine, even the way you shut that engine down <coughs> is important. You're not really supposed to just pull up and switch it off. Nobody pays attention to that. Everybody's going to drive about the same way, but that turbocharger's got to have time to cool down. Yeah, it's got to sit down. Yeah. I and it's a uh, turbocharger timer. Whenever they turn the car off and pull the key out, it still runs for like two minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's doing it to protect itself. Yeah, that's smart.
All right, number 33. Technician A says most vehicle manufacturers recommend the use of SAE 5W30 or SAE 10W30 engine oil. Technician B says hydrodynamic oil pressure around engine bearings can be over 1,000 PSI. We talked a little bit about that earlier in a previous question. That's C. Yeah, basically. Uh, nowadays, they're all you know looking at thinner oil. Used to it was more than that. Um, Technician A says most manufacturers recommend changing oil every six months or 5,000 miles. Technician B says the oil pump is driven directly by the crankshaft or gear shaft from the camshaft. That's basically B. Uh, number 35. But now, wait a minute. Uh, on this Toyota Camry out here, on this little stand, the oil pump is driven by the timing belt. Is that a problem? What if something happened and the oil pump stopped turning? Would that be a problem? I mean, well, if it stopped turning, wouldn't everything else stop turning too? Because the timing belt's keeping the shafts in. <laughs> That's pretty smart, really. And there's a leak on that thing that somebody needs to fix too. There's a leak somebody needs to fix on the neon. If you want some credit for finding and fixing an oil leak, there's a leak somebody needs to fix on that Toyota. You're gonna troubleshoot that thing and fix that oil leak so when you crank it up, it doesn't drip on the floor. See, that's important. To know how to do that anyway. Okay. Um, let's see. As engine oil. Wait a minute. Technician A says most manufacturers recommend changing oil every six months. Did we do that one already? Yeah, you're right, you're right, I'm sorry. Think engine oil is used in an engine. It becomes A, thinner as a result of chemical breakdown, B, thinner due to oxidation, wear metals, and combustion byproducts, C, thicker due to temperature changes, or D, thicker due to oxidation, wear, and combustion byproducts. That's D. That's D. It gets thicker. And we had seen this guy one time that bought this Ford pickup truck. It had a 306 in it. And uh, back in those days, when Ford built an engine, they would paint the whole engine gray, including the oil filter. And the oil filter was just painted gray like everything else. And so the guy comes in here, and he the truck comes in on a hook, and it's got 30,000 miles on it, or 35,000 miles, or whatever it is. And it's still got the original oil filter on it. And we pull the engine oil pan off, you could stand a screwdriver up in the oil pan. It was like tar. Wow. I mean, the oil just pure turned to old black, thick tar, and it destroyed the motor. And the service manager called him to task on that. And he goes, oh, no, I changed the oil over 3,000 miles. It's not my fault, you know, which was a bald-faced lie, you know. But uh, anyway, all right, let me see. Um, let me see. Technician A says the lubricating system forms a seal between the piston rings and cylinder walls. Uh, technician B says lubricating system uh, helps cool engine parts. Who's right about that? That's basically both right. You know, you got to... Without that oil, you remember how we was trying to squirt oil in there and bring the compression up on that motor that was bad that we got? Which of these are forms of oil contamination? A, emissions and pollution. B, sludge and dilution. C, viscosity and clouding. D, diffusion and dilution. That's B, actually. Sludge and dilution. You know about sludge. And the oil pressure relief valve controls what oil pressure in the lubrication system? Maximum oil pressure. Uh, this is something you need to be aware of. There was a guy that I knew that was, he was a sort of an engine guy. He liked working on engines and all that. So he built this little 3.8 engine that was in this Ford car uh, that had star for oil locked up. So he built it all up and he put an oil pump on it and everything, if I remember right. And when he cranked it up, it star for oil and locked up again. And so he had pulled it off and was torn it back down and he was scratching his head about it. And I says, I showed him, I says, look, the relief valve is over here in the, timing cover, it's not made into the oil pump, and the release valve is stuck, open. So you got no pressure, you know what I mean? Because it's having to push that relief valve up and open a port so that it can have that. It's like, like I tell you, it's kind of like a regulator. If you got a regulator with a broken spring or a stuck piston, there's no regulation, it's just dumping that oil pressure out all the time, and it just wipes it out, you know? And so you always need to be aware, when, I'm, when you're looking at one that's starved for oil, it's usually because that um, relief valve spring broke or the piston got some trash up in there and stuck open and all that. And uh, I mean, we had a, there was this lady had a 99 F-150 that she pulled up in her yard and she switched it off and it was running just fine. And the next morning she said she went out to get in it and she went to crank it and it was locked up, totally locked up. And we got it in here. It was a nice truck. We got it in here. And the oil pump relief valve had stuck on that darn thing yeah, for some reason. I don't know why. A spring broke or something. It was hung up in there, and it was just hung up in its, you know, maximum 
shove position and it uh, just destroyed that motor. And that, that relief valve is important. You better find out where that relief valve is and you better be looking that thing over real good. Usually there'll be a little snap ring or something you can take out. You make sure it slides in its bore real nice. I mean, that's something that people overlook. They're thinking pistons, rods, crankshaft, camshaft, lifters, all this other stuff. Everybody's thinking about all this stuff. And, you know, but they don't, I mean, that relief valve, if you're putting another oil pump on it and it's one of them cast iron kind like I got up there, that one right there has got an oil relief valve built into it. That Toyota, it's in that cover, but it's not, I mean, it's, in, it's away from the oil pump. You know what I'm saying? It's in a different spot. So always keep your mind on where that oil pump is, I mean, where that oil pressure relief valve is. Real important that you do that. Um, let me see. Uh, what type of oil pump is pictured in this picture right here? What kind of oil pump is pictured in the picture? Yeah, that's what I'm... Everybody got that? Everybody like his answer? External gear? That sounds good to me. Some vehicle use an oil cooler to help maintain proper oil temperature. And what should the oil temperature range be? 212 to 300. 212 to 300. Give Mr. Lundy a bubblegum cigar. Anybody got something to say? Okay. What we're going to do today...